We're the Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by The harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Chosen as part of the best of mankind We spread the word of Islam Each man at each hour In all of his power Each flower, each tree Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And welcome to our fifth episode And today is a very, very special episode I'm Dr. Steph Keris Abu Yasser and I will speak today especially about what I have done in the last couple of years. I've done quite some research about the Ottoman Empire, and this is the book that I've written, Europe's Forgotten Ottoman Heritage. And we will, especially today, speak about the forgotten Ottoman heritage. This episode and coming episode should actually focus very much and will focus very much, inshallah, on the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire, a vast empire, a magnificent empire, mighty, and it has shaken Europe. And actually, you know, the, just alone the idea of the Ottoman Empire, or just alone the, the idea of the Turks coming back, is already shaking, you know, the people in Europe. Now, let's take a closer look into this empire and see how it actually started. We spoke a little bit about what was, what was the surrounding, what was the environment of, of the time of the Byzantine Empire, during the time that um, actually the Byzantines were the mightiest ones in the Mediterranean Sea, the Eastern at least, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Now, I would like to now go deeper into Osman Ghazi, who was actually the founder of the Ottoman Empire. And that's why, of course, it's called Ottoman, Ottoman Empire because of his name, Osman Othman. Now, Osman, Osman Ghazi, Ghazi simply means the warrior for Islam. He was not as it's mistakenly taken sometimes, he was not a sultan, he was an emir. So he was actually an emir of an emirate. And he was the warrior who was actually protecting even Europe from the influence of the Mongolians and actually, actually, you know, the threat of the Asian people coming over to get into Europe. Now, Osman Ghazi is a figure who actually is a gift, was a gift for Europe as well. And not only for Islam, and not only for the Muslims, and not only for the Ottomans. Let's take a closer look. I had the chance when I went to Istanbul, and I made my documentary, I had the chance to actually visit his tomb. Let's take a look at the tombs. Let's take a look at the film that I'm going to show you now. This tomb, the mausoleum, as you can see it now, the Turks, as I mentioned earlier, follow pretty much the branch of Sufi Islam, as we have mentioned before already. Now, they do have a lot of mausoleums in their country, as we have seen just the one now, and they consider mausoleums as being something that honors the person. Now, Islamically seen, we have to be careful with something like that. I have just shown you the mausoleum now, just basically to show you the way that they have treated their sultans, mashallah, which is a good, in general, it's a good thing in general. The idea is good. But Islamically seen, Islamically soon seen, this is not something that we should do. Um, it is pretty much the Sufi branch of Islam that pays a lot of attention to tombs, to tomb worshipping, and this type of ideas. Um, but unfortunately, we will have to go back to certain tombs to certain places where the sultans were buried in Istanbul, in Bursa, first of all in Bursa and in Istanbul. Now, I will show you some more of these films that I had the chance to film when I was in Istanbul and in Bursa. And we would, I would like to go through it show, uh, slowly but, but surely. And just take a look at the way that the sultans were handling the first sultans actually up to Sultan Mohammed Fatih or the Turkish name Sultan Mehmed Fatih up to his time because the next episode is going to focus pretty much on Sultan Mohammed Fatih inshallah who is Fatih the opener of Constantinople inshallah again this episode is going to look into the foundation 
of the Ottoman Empire and to the founders. And I use the word, the plural for founder, I, use, I say clearly founders, because we do have Osman as, of course, the main founder, but we also have Orhan. Orhan was his son. They have made mausoleums for both of them in Bursa, again in Bursa, not in Istanbul, and uh, we will be able to visit them still nowadays, and they look like this, like the one that you saw before, and this is uh, basically the inside of the mausoleum that I showed you before. Now, as you can see, the way that they have, they have taken care of the mausoleums is beautiful to see, but again, we have to be careful, as I said. Islamically seen, this is not the right way to treat um, anybody, actually, neither Sultan or whatever he is. We, we, we should just bury our dead people, just get them buried, and then basically they, they, they will be judged then by, uh, by Allah, inshallah. Now, if we take a closer look to the other videos that I have furthermore for you, you can see some more of these tombs and the mausoleums that have been erected for the sultans. So uh, for Osman, who was again not a sultan, for Sultan Orhan, who was the first one to be called sultan, and Sultan Chelebi. Now these are all very significant figures, of course. They played an important role in the Ottoman Empire. They played an important role in history, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And I would like to take a closer look and take a closer look to them and just see what have they achieved actually. How far have they come? What about the Ottoman Empire? How far can we, how far did it reach during their time? As we said before, Osman Ghazi, he was the founder. He was born in 1258 in the 13th century and died in 1326. Now, the year he was born, was the very year the Mongols sacked Baghdad and were terrorizing the Muslims. We all know and we have all heard about the terror that the Mongols actually spread throughout the Muslim world. Not only, but throughout the Muslim world, definitely. At the age of 67, Osman died. And he was buried at Bursa, where, as we just saw, the mausoleum is still there. The mausoleum of his son is standing right next to his. Osman the very name Osman is originally, of course, the Arabic name Osman, and the Turkish variation is Osman. Now, he proclaimed his independence from his overlord, the Seljuk Sultan Kaikubat I, upon the collapse of the Seljuk Empire. As you mentioned in the episode before, the Turkish tribes were a lot, were many. And the Seljuks were the ones who were before the Ottomans there, but they were also Turks. And the Seljuks managed to establish an empire which did not go into Europe. So basically, Osman was the one who took over from the Seljuks, and Orhan, his son, was the one who took the Ottoman Empire into Europe. And we will see that, inshallah. Now, Sultan, uh, Os Osman, Sorry, he was not a sultan again. Osman, Osman was the one who was and will be considered for all times, I think, inshallah, the strongest, the biggest warrior ever, actually. The beginning of the, 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 the Ottoman Empire, really, if, if you look at uh, the way he was dealing with his subjects, the way he was dealing with um, the, the, the people around him, um, it's unbelievable. It's really an example. It's an example of, of a good Muslim ruler, basically, you can say. Um, he was strict. He was strict. He was strict, but he was also very just. It has, it's, it's known. It's a common, common fact, and it's a historical fact. He had the chance to fight the Mongols and to actually win over them. And that, of course, gave him the biggest reputation ever. Now, he was respected and very looked well upon. Now, the wealthy Byzantine Empire was weakening to his west, so Osman could expand his empire more and more at the expense of the Byzantines. Osman became the chief, or Bey, as the Turks called it, upon his father's death in 1281. 
In 1299, he symbolically created an independent state when he stopped the payment of tribute to the Mongol emperor. So basically, from 1300 on, the Ottomans were independent. They had their own state. Now, if we look at the period of the development of the Ottoman Empire, we can see now, there's a small table that I've made, which tells you the first period of the Ottoman Empire, which we can call the rise of it. So basically 1299 until 1453 was the rise of the Ottoman Empire. And as you can see now, this period, this period is clearly gone into history as rise of the Ottoman Empire, and this starts in 1299 and finishes in 1453. That was the opening of Constantinople. Now, we have first, of course, the period before Osman, as we discussed already. Then we have Osman I himself. Then we have Orhan, his son. And that's how it goes on, of course. We have Murad, Bayezid, Mehmed, and Murad II. Okay? Now, Orhan I, so Osman's son, was born in 1281 and died in March 1361 in Bursa. He, he was, again, one of the better examples of Muslim rulers, no doubt about it. We have Christian sources that refer to Orhan in such a way that they actually admired him. We can clearly say they admired him. He treated the Christians decently when he conquered Nicaea, became well known among the people. And not only Turks, but also a large number of foreign historians confirmed that he was a great man by all means. No doubt about it, again. Orhan was the first Ottoman to bear the title of Sultan and to create the first Ottoman coins. Now, he was the longest living and the one of the longest reigning of the future Ottoman Sultans. In his last years, he had left most of the powers of state in the hands of his second son, Murad, and lived a secluded life in Bursa. He became very religious, as people say in general, as, as we are told, as sources um, indicate. He became religious and took himself away from, from the empire. In 1299, Orhan married Holofira, who was the daughter of the Prince of Yarhisar, or Byzantine Princess Elena, who was of ethnic Greek descent. A very, very important fact now, especially to my people, that actually Orhan married a Greek princess, a Byzantine princess. Now, out of this marriage, Murad came, now, according to our constitution, and this is the funny and ironic thing about it, if we look at our Greek constitution nowadays, the recent one from 1982, it says that a father as well as the mother can give nationality through. Now, I'm just mentioning it. Basically, what does it mean to us nowadays if we look at that and if we consider our Greek constitution? Can we say that Murad, the son of Orhan and his Byzantine wife, was Greek? Now, many Turks will be very upset about what I said just now, but, but according to our constitution, we can basically clearly say that. <laughs> so anyway, let's just leave it like this. Let's just leave it like this. And this did not just happen once. It is an important fact in history that the Ottomans married, at the beginning especially, many Byzantine princesses and actually many Greek, they had many Greek wives. So children coming out of this bad luck, obviously, we can consider them Greeks, more or less. Now, Greek nationalists would jump up and say, yes, the Ottoman Empire was a Greek empire. Now, that's not what I'm saying. But it's something that it gives you food of thought. But after the break, we will go deeper into this one, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Chosen as part of the best of mankind, we spread the word of Islam. Look, how to create a website and which Islamic websites to actually visit. What inspired you to create your own website? One of the challenges mm. that we, we, we face every day, the site or the, the application should be accessible worldwide. I remember uh, when I was younger, um, uh, one of my friends uh, asked me to, to convince his father to, to get him a, a desktop, even, even the laptop. Uh, when, you, when you come, if you compare both of them in terms of uh, cost, uh, laptop roughly um, cost twice 
and the money if you, if you, if you compared with the desktop. Hackers, the word hackers, most of uh, the young the youth people are very interesting about that word. They say, hey, I'd like to be a hacker because there is a type of hacker, great, doing a great job. We call them a uh, white hat hacker. Chosen the spark of the best of mankind, we spread the word of Islam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to a second part of a very, very, very important episode. Now, it goes very personal, it becomes very, very personal now. As you saw before, we're talking about the Ottoman Empire. Was it now a Turkish Empire? Was it a Greek Empire? You know, now, please do not take it personal, especially if we have any Greek viewers. Please do not take it personal because I'm going to hear a lot of insults later. Now, please, let's, let's just go back again to the facts. As I said before, Orhan the first sultan of the Ottoman Empire actually married a Byzantine princess. She was Greek indeed, and she accepted Islam, yes, and she changed her name. Now, let me just find the name again. The name, her name when she accepted Islam was Nilufer Hatun. Nilufer Hatun. Now, Orhan, being a good Muslim, mashallah, he married more women. Not only just one, he didn't stick with one wife, he had more wives. And one of his wives was not only Greek, but, but another wife was the princess of Serbia. Now, Theodora, or Theodora, princess of Serbia, was the daughter of Stefan IV, the king of Serbia. Now, amazing again for the Serbs now. Now we're going to have the Serb side getting upset about what I just said. Now, um, Again, when this happened, again, he didn't just stick to these two, but he went on and he married Theodoro Maria Kandakuzenos, which is another princess of Byzantium, now another Greek princess. So um, he must have liked Greek, Greek women, most probably. So again, uh, 1346, he married Princess uh, Theodora Maria Kandakuzenos. Now, uh, she was the daughter of John VI Kandakuzenos, who was the emperor of Byzantium. Now, a very, very important fact again. So, these are actually, there's nothing strange about it, because we will see in, in the past, in the past in history, we, we will find very often that um, k k princes get married to, 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 uh, to uh, princes of a certain country get married to, to a prince of another country, which, of course, then brings the two countries together. This has happened very, very many times in the past. This will happen also after the Ottoman Empire, and it will happen, of course, during the Ottoman Empire. But what is significant here is that we have Orhan, the first sultan of the Ottoman Empire, marrying, marrying two Greek princesses and a Serb. You know? So this is amazing if we just look at what happened just some years ago, 1992 to 1995, with the Bosnian War. We should not forget the hatred that we saw on our TV screens, unfortunately, we saw, we saw how much the, the Serbs really hated and hate still the Muslims. And we should not forget that there is Serbian blood in the Ottoman, uh, in the Ottoman, Ottoman dynasty. And there is also Greek blood, very much actually, Greek blood in the Ottoman dynasty as well. Now, let's move on because I think I've said enough and I've upset most probably enough people at this moment. Sultan Orhan, there is a lot to say about him, but but further details can be obtained. You can find them in my book, inshallah, or you can check them on, you can find online. There's, there's enough to get about Orhan, to find out about Orhan, because he has really, there's a lot, a lot written about him, and Orhan has gone into history as, as, as a magnificent, as a, as a big sultan, actually. Next sultan, who played an important role, Sultan Murat, Murat I, who, as we said before, was the Greek son, oh, what did I say? I said Greek again. Anyway, Murat, who was the son of Sultan Orhan, right? And he was nicknamed Hudavandegar. Hudavandegar is a Persian name, which means the godlike one. And I think that should make you think. The name is the godlike one. It should make you think as a Muslim. What does it mean exactly? I just leave it up to there. Can we call anybody the God-like one? Can there be anybody who is like God? Obviously not. But he was given this name. 
Now, it shows a little bit, I think, the Muslim, the idea of the Ottomans that they had about Islam and um, the, the, the Sufi branch that they were following. It makes it clear, I think, and we should be careful with that, obviously. Now, uh, Sultan Murad, uh, he was the one who will play or who ha he has played an, an, an active role in um, spreading the, uh, in, in expanding the Ottoman Empire and like this spreading, of course, also Islam into the Balkans. He was the one who was killed in Kosovo. Now, Kosovo nowadays, if we just look around what's happening in the Balkans nowadays, Kosovo is an independent country, but it is not recognized by Serbia. Serbia would like to keep Kosovo because exactly of that reason. Because it reminds them of, hey, we won that time over the Ottomans. We, that time, we killed, we killed their sultan. And this is something that is for them a very important thing, a very, very, very important thing to bring up their national psyche. They, they look, the Serbs, as well as the Greeks, the Orthodox peoples of the Balkan, they actually consider anything that is Islamic to be Turkish. Alert from anything Finder. That is Turkish is bad. The disc that Kingston is, is in use people. and could not now, be ejected. In, in the case of Kosovo, I think we can understand a little bit. I hope you can understand a little bit why the Serbs are keeping so much to not wanting to recognize Kosovo. They want to keep it as part of uh, Serbia. Sultan Murad, basically, Sultan Murad is still buried, is not buried in Kosovo, as people might think, but his internal organs are buried in Kosovo. He himself is buried in Turkey, okay? And he has his own masjid actually there. Now, Murat committed another crime in the eyes of the Greeks. He married, he followed his father's footsteps and he married another Greek lady. His, his wife was Greek. Okay, so actually their children again come from the same lineage, okay, and being having Greek blood inside of them. Now, Sultan Murat, another important thing for Sultan Murat to know about Sultan Murat was that he was the one who conquered Macedonia. He made Edirne, Adrianople as it was called at that time, the city of Adrianople, Edirne, he made, his, he made this his capital. So after Bursa, Edirne became the Ottoman capital, and after Edirne, of course, after the opening of Constantinople, 1453, Constantinople, Istanbul. Now, so he transfer, tra transfers the capital from Bursa to Edirne. Adrianople is called Edirne now from now on. So he is now stable, he settles in Europe, and the Ottomans are now clearly in Europe. Sultan Murat played an important role for the north, for the history of the north of Greece. And we will talk about it, inshallah, in another episode where we focus a little bit on the Islamic history, the Islamic heritage, the Ottoman heritage of Greece, especially the northern part of Greece, which is called Macedonia, and Thrace, of course. Now, um, just a point there. Macedonia, there is a country which is independent, which came out of, the, out of Yugoslavia, out of the breakup of Yugoslavia, which is called former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, with the capital Skopje. And there is a province in Greece which is called Macedonia. So we're talking about the province in Greece, which is the biggest province actually in northern Greece, is Macedonia. And the independent country nowadays, which is called former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, is an independent country, but they claim to still use this name. Now, the Greeks have a problem with that, and because of historic reasons, of course. Now, Osman, we have seen his slide. I would like to show you Orhan, his son, who is also the one, just to go back quickly to him, who is the one who started the idea with the Tughras, using Tughra. Now you can see next to his picture, next to Orhan, Orhan's drawing, you can find a, a symbol which is called Tughra. Now, this Tughra was used throughout the Ottoman Empire by all the sultans, 
all the sultans and they all used the same structure of the Tughra as you can see here now on the right of uh, Orhan and they basically inscribed their names in it. So this is the typical Tughra for Orhan that you can see here. Now, Sultan Murad I, who reigned from 1360 to 1389, that's himself, you can see him now, and next to him you can find his Tughra. Now you will find, you will be able to see throughout the former Ottoman Empire, throughout the Balkan countries nowadays, you will be able to find castles, you will be able to find Ottoman structures with, with Tughras in there, which indicate that that was the time that this castle or this specific monument was built during the time of this specific Sultan. And you will find his Tughra in there. Now, this makes it easier, of course, to understand and to recognize uh, when a specific building was built. Now, Sultan Murat. Next one, Sultan Bayezid. Sultan Bayezid, who was the one who played a role before, before things change. Now, Sultan Bayezid was nicknamed Yildirim, which means the thunderbolt. Why? Because of the speed at which he used to take strategic decisions and to move his troops from one place to another. Now, he was born in Bursa. He was born in Bursa. And he was the fourth sultan of the Ottoman Empire from 1389 to 1402. His wife was actually from Serbia, was a princess of Serbia. Now, very interesting case again. But there is so, so, so much more to talk about. And we will, inshallah, inshallah, I hope to see you again actually in our next episode, which will focus a little bit more on the development of the Ottoman Empire and, if, of course, especially Sultan Mehmed Fateh, who opened Constantinople, inshallah. I thank you very much for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are the Muslim Ummah, and each day that goes by, the harder we try, in gratitude we pray to Allah. Chosen as part of the best of mankind We spread the word of Islam Each man at each hour In all of his power Each flower, each tree Everything that we see Spread the word of Spread the word of Islam Oh fortunate one Paradise must be won